Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so now I'll show the sort of main technical result in the talk. Um, so I'm going to be giving a proof of this switching lemma in terms of size, in terms of the DNF size. Um, so as before, f will be a m clause DNF. Um, and so the, recall that Hustad switching lemma, the classic switching lemma, said that if f has width k, then we, we get a bound of the form order pk to the t. So what we're going to do, similar, similar to what we did with average sensitivity, we're going to replace width with log of size. Um, and uh, at first, it's not clear that this really accomplishes very much. Um, you can use the switching lemma, actually, to prove the same lower bounds for, for parity function. Um, but it turns out that this new, uh, this new analysis of, the, of, the, of this that, that we'll show uh, can be extended in certain interesting ways that the original switching lemma can't. So I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. Um, so the the proof of this uh, of this result is like the original one by itself. So. Uh, it doesn't. It the doesn't original one implies this yeah. one. You know, uh, it's not totally clear to me. So f the original one implies this one for t. Uh, up to, is that clear that it applies it for all t, actually? T is very well, well, so what if you do um, a random restriction with like probability a half? Yeah, so, like but the problem know. is that you get some error term, and then you, that error, you're you going to get some error term, right? Um, well, um, okay, so the probability Let, let me put a let me put a pin in it. So it uh, it even could be the case. So so in fact I um I can prove this using a combination of the switching lemma and the multi switching lemma. There are ways to prove this without this entropy argument. The point is not 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 just this bound, but uh, I want to claim that you can do something more with the proof technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. So the way that the proofs of the switching lemma work are we actually construct. Uh, a decision tree called a canonical decision tree for f under any restriction. So I'll, I mean, I'll define this in a, in a bit. I'm going to give a sketch first. So we define a particular decision tree, and we show that the probability that this decision tree has depth t is bounded by the, the bound we want. Okay, um, and then uh, right. So I mean, so if the depth is bigger than t, then the depth of the canonical decision tree is also going to be bigger than. than and this is the minimal decision tree. So then. Right, so proving this is enough. Okay. Uh, so first, here's a, a high-level sketch of the, of the proof of the switching lemma. In fact, both Hostad's and, and, and ours. Okay, so uh, I guess it's conventional to define bad sub t to be the set of uh, bad restrictions where this, uh, where this event was. So the set of restrictions rho such that this canonical decision tree, which, which I've yet to define, of f under the restriction rho, uh, has depth t. Okay, so what we want to sh what we want to show is that um, we want to bound the probability that the p random restriction is in the set bad sub t. Show that this is at most p times log m to the t. Okay, so the way so uh, and, and I should say this this uh, version of this proof here is uh, due to Rasborov. Called Rasborov's labeling argument. It's a little different from Hustad's original proof. So the idea is that for each bad restriction, we define an extension, uh, which is denoted by rho star, okay, which fixes t additional variables. So everything fixed by rho is also fixed by rho star and gets the same value, but rho star is going to fix exactly t extra uh, variables. And then we have the following observation, just this sequence of equalities. Let's just go through them. So this is the thing we're trying to bound, the probability that the p random restriction is t bad. Well, we can sum over all uh, t bad restrictions rho. It's the probability that rp equals rho. Um, now, um, since rho star has exactly t uh, additional variables which are, which are fixed, then the, the, uh, the, the weight of or rho star is less than the weight of rho by precisely this factor, 2p over 1 minus p to the t. Okay. 
So we, we have this, exp this equality here. And all right, uh, we'll rewrite this as follows. Let's just take the sum over all, um, all restrictions sigma. Um, and we'll count how many times that shows up uh, like this. So we'll take the probability that RP equals sigma. And then this, this term is being counted this many times, the, the number of um, t bad rho such that rho star equals sigma. All right, but uh, now we have uh, an expectation here. So let's, let's pull this, this term in front. We have the sum over all sigma, the probability that RP equals sigma times this. So this is just the expected, so we're taking the expectation over a p random restriction of the number of pre-images that RP has under this map from rho to rho star. Okay. These are very straightforward uh, manipulations. But so let's just re rewrite this here as one line. So uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that you know, our p is at most one half. So let's just call this order p to the t. Okay, so here's what we, what we just showed. Okay, so the name of the game now is to bound. So, uh, well, here that order p to the t is already accounted for. And now we just need to bound the expected number of pre-images under this map from row to row star of a p random restriction. And this actually, this part here won't even depend on the value of p. Okay, so this is the, the, the main part of the argument, or the remaining part of the argument is now to show that the expected number of pre-images here is order log m to the t. Okay. And the, the argument that we'll show is going to be similar to this argument that the average sensitivity of f is at most twice the entropy of the first witness function. Okay. And as I mentioned before, it's not exactly entropy that we're going to be dealing with, but it, we're going to be using Jensen's inequality with respect to this concave function, x maps to 1 over t log, natural log of x to the t. Okay. So the, the, same, uh, the same template is used in the proof of Hustad switching lemma. So in the case where f has width k, then we bound this expectation in a, uh, in a very uh, strong way. So, well, then what you can show is that this map from rho to rho star to the extended restrictions is order k to the t to 1. So every single restriction sigma has at most order k to the t pre-images under this extension map. Well, therefore, this expectation is, 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 is at most order k to the t. Okay. And, then, and then one has uh, the, the, the desired bound. Okay. So in our setting, we can't, we, we can't bound the maximum of this over all values of rp, but we, but we can bound the expectation. So we, uh, we still haven't defined this canonical? No, no, I haven't, yeah, I haven't defined. The definition will be the same for the two proofs? It will, actually. Yeah, so, right, so, so, uh, yeah. right, so, so a lot of this will look familiar. Uh, uh, right, so I have, I've yet to define this, and, and I've yet to define this extension. So oh, let me do that next. Okay, so again, we have our DNF, and let me now denote this, the set of variables of the ELF clause by VL, V sub L. Okay, here's the definition of the canonical decision tree, which I, I expect, well, if you've seen the proof of Hastad switching limit before, then you, you've seen this. So, um, okay, so there's some cases. So first, if any clause becomes satisfied by the restriction rho, so rho fixes all of the variables and sets them to the, to the you know, to the uh, appropriate value. If any clause is satisfied, then we just output one. I mean, it, the decision tree is just the constant one. And if all clauses are falsified by rho, okay, every clause is forced to zero by rho, then we just output zero. Okay. So in the interesting case, if neither of these holds, then we let's let L be the first clause index, the, the index of the first relevant clause, so uh, CL, which is not, for, by relevant I mean the first clause that is not forced to zero one under rho. Okay, I'll, I'll refer to this as relevant clause. You can see already this is look, looks like the first witness function in some sense. Uh, let me let S denote the number of surviving variables of the clause, of the ELF clause under the restriction rho, okay? And because this is not forced by rho, there's at least one surviving variable. Now let me denote by Q 
the set of surviving variables. So it, it's, uh, it's a, an S element subset of VL, of the variables of the, of the other clause. OK, so LSQ. And then finally, so what, what do we do in the decision tree? Now what we're going to do is we're going to query all of the variables of Q, okay, uh, in order, okay? Uh, not adaptive, we just, qu just query them all. And we receive some answers in the decision tree, and I'll denote this by A. And we can, we can represent A by a, you know, a, a sequence of F, length S, of zeros and ones, so the answers to the queries. Okay. And then we, we, so this is defined by, by, by recursion, then we, can, we proceed as the canonical decision tree of f under an extension of rho. We, we, will, we, we take rho and then we, we tack onto it uh, the, the restriction which uh, the, the variables in q get answers a and, and we proceed. Okay. So th to see that this, uh, that this uh, is well defined, note that, note that the elf clause is clearly forced to 0 or 1 under this extended restriction since we've now set all of its, its variables. So therefore, this, this process of, must eventually terminate. So the next relevant clause in this process will always be greater than L. Okay. I, I should say, I'm going to give this definition, uh, and then I'm going to illustrate it by an example. So, uh, okay. so now, for each branch in the canonical decision tree, if we think of an entire branch in the uh, canonical decision tree, uh, which has length T, so let's see, it makes T total queries, then it's characterized by the following data. Okay, we'll call this the, the branch data for the, this particular branch of the canonical decision tree. So let me now denote by R the number of relevant clauses in this process. So the number of clauses that come up in, the, in, 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 in this process, so the number of recursive calls, if you will. Okay, and because each, each, I mean, each relevant clause makes at least one query, so R is between one and T. And I'll, I'll let L, for, for each i from 1 to r, I'll let li be the index or the location, so L for location of the ith relevant clause. And note that this is a, an increasing sequence, okay? So L1 to LR is some yeah, inc increasing sequence between 1 and m. So that's before we, you know, si is the number of variables that are queried from, from the lth clause, from the lith clause. Qi is the set of variables queried from the lith clause. Okay. And I'm going to claim that it's a subset not just of vli choose s, but actually of vli minus all the variables in the preceding clauses. And a sub i is the answers to queries qi. Okay. So just what we have, yeah, uh, well, hopefully this. Is it all the variables in the preceding classes, not just the queries of the preceding classes? Uh, why, um, those, uh, those variables are sent by row okay. or by... Uh, oh, right, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, and actually, yeah, here's a, the, good, there's a typo here already. <laughs> this should be row union this. Good. So, right, and just to, to, to clarify what, what exactly is, are the queried variables from the clause CLI, well, this is going to be the, the surviving variables of this clause under, this should, this should say, row union the you know, <coughs> queries and answers from the previous steps. Okay. And, right, and the observation, the important observation is that these, these lie in, all of these queries lie in the variables of the, L, the Lith clause, which are disjoint from the previous variable, since all of those get set in, in by these queries, yeah, together with row. Okay. One final definition before I illustrate with an example. So, so what is this map, this uh, extended restriction? So for each, for each T bad restriction row, so suppose uh, for each T bad restriction row, I'm going to make some row star, which has T additional queries. So, so here's how we define this. So we have the canonical decision tree. And let's consider the data associated with the longest branch in this canonical decision tree. Okay, and I'll, just for short, I'll abbreviate this by, by the vector of L's, S's, Q's, and A's. Okay. And yeah, let's assume this has length, length T. So then we define rho star as 
rho uh, together with um, the following restriction. So we're going to set the variables in these queries, in the set of queries q1 to qr. But we don't set them with the answers under the longest path. Rather, we, we're going to set them with um, the unique answers to these queries, which are consistent with the clause, which agree with the, with the, uh, the, the sign of the, of the variable in this clause. So that the clause is not satisfied. So that the, uh, so so that the it's a DNF formula, so these are actually terms, probably. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm abusing the yeah, right. People, right, uh, maybe conjunctive clause, uh, right. It would be more standard to call these terms. Right. So, so I'm, I'm going illu to, I'll illustrate what this. Yeah, maybe let me illustrate by an example, here. Okay, so this. Um, okay, so here's our. Uh, Here's our DNF, happens to be a three DNF. Okay. And let's say that our restriction is this row here. Okay, so it just fixes two variables. In this case, x1 is fixed to one, x4 is fixed to zero. So the, the uh, extension row star is going to be row together with some other stuff. So let, let's see how that's formed. So, okay, so first of all, right, when we apply row, then it fixes some of these variables. They get value zero, one, right? And the, now no clause is satisfied, completely satisfied here, so we have, so the process uh, is non-trivial. Some of the clauses, however, get falsified, so the, we'll just, we can kind of ignore those. And then um, in the canonical decision tree, we, we find the first um, relevant clause, okay? And in this case, the, the right, so the first relevant clause is, is the first clause, so L1 is 1. And there are two surviving variables there. Okay, and the set of those variables is x2 and x3. Um, and now the way we form row star is we, we, you know, we query these variables and we, we follow the answers on the longest path. Okay, so let's say that those happen to be, you know, set x2 gets one and x3 gets one. Okay, so I mean, note that when we, when, we, when we substitute these here, then this becomes falsified. But what, when we're building um, the extended restriction row star, we're going to um, look at A1 star. So we're going to assign the same variables, but we're going to assign them in the unique way that satisfies this, this first clause. Okay, so that, that, that would mean we're setting x2 to 1 and x3 to 0. And so when we're constructing this extended restriction, row star now looks like, looks like this, and we continue. Is it other questions about uh, this example so far? Okay, and let's, let's take this one more step. So now, now we can kind of forget about this A1 star, and we're going to now um, extend a row um, according to the, to the long path. So we, we now set Q1 according to A1. Okay, so now we get a 1 here, a 0 here, and so on. And this ends up killing on, okay, now this clause is falsified. Again, no clause is satisfied, so the process continues. And we find the net, you know, we find again the, the next relevant clause. In this case, it's this, this one here. Um, and, okay, so the second relevant clause is the third clause, so L2 is three. And the number of surviving variables is just one. Okay, and the set of surviving variables, just X5. And in the long path, let's say x5 gets set to 0, this will be falsified. But you know, the a2 star sets x5 to 1 in order to make this satisfied. We add that to our long path, and the process continues. So hopefully, you're, yeah, hopefully this helps uh, internalize this, this notation a bit. So. But we've defined canonical decision tree, and we've defined uh, the uh, extension of, of, a, of, a, of a restriction row. So row star is row together with the assignment to the queried variables, which satisfies the relevant clauses. Okay, so here's a kind of key observation. And after this observation, we are almost done with the proof of Hastad switching lemma, and then we're, we're going to uh, add a coda to that. So this is sort of the, the decoding step in the, in the Razbrov's version of the argument. Okay, so the observation is that if, 
if given knowledge of rho star, so if I give you rho star as a set, so I don't, you, know, you don't know which part is rho and which part is this. Let's give you rho star, and I'll give you this, this uh, branch data, okay? Just the, the number of, you know, the number of queries, the set of queries, and the, the answers. Then given knowledge of this, and of course knowledge of f, you, we can recover both the restriction rho as well as the relevant clause indices L. Okay? And we can do this as follows. Here's an algorithm, if you will, for recovering this from, from this. Well, so, well, we observe the following. I mean, um, so there's some first uh, relevant clause L1. And in order for that to be the relevant clause, it means that the, all the previous clauses under, under this rho under rho were zero, and since rho star is an extension of rho, then these, these remain zero. And then by construction of the rho star, this clause is satisfied under rho star. So we can, to discover the first relevant uh, clause index, we just look for the first clause which is satisfied under rho star. So great, we've learned L1 at this point. And now we already knew, um, we knew Q1 and A1, so now we can modify rho star by overwriting, um, overwriting the values it set to Q1, overwriting them from A1 star to A1, to the actual values on the long path. And then we can observe that uh, the next relevant clause, index L2, you know, so, so the, the, this will be the first clause which is satisfied under rho star of, you know, this modified rho star, everything between L1 and, and that will be zero, okay? And this, you know, this, this sort of uh, continues. Then, then you know, uh, eventually in the final step, you know, we've learned, uh, we've learned you know, L1 to LR minus one, and we've learned uh, you know, all, all, all of these guys, so we can sort of undo this. So, so L is the key missing information, otherwise this would have all been trivial. Given rho star and S L Q A, it was trivial to recover rho. Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, right. Yeah. So the way I, the way I've stated this. So I've defined Q here. Just, it will be convenient in a moment that you know Q is actually the set of variables. So. Um, uh, so the next observation. Yeah, I didn't include this on the slide, but the, um, a key point here is that we don't actually need to know the set Q, the set of variables. So recall that you know, well, the each each um, each QI is a subset of you know of the V uh, V L I choose S I, right? But uh, it's enough actually if I if I only tell you Q I prime, okay, which is an element of let's say numbers from. Uh, one to VLI, which is SI. Suppose I don't tell you actually what the variable is. As, as Madhu points out, um, uh, I didn't need a, I didn't need to do all this to, to recover to recover rho, right? I could simply overwrite, you know, the Qs with the As since I gave you the Qs and the As. But if I don't give you the the Qs, I instead give you QI prime, which just tells you the location within the clause, okay, of the of the. Um, of the then you need to actually discover sort of what is what the clause li is first, and then you can figure out what these variables are. Okay. Now that uh, right, that's the next key sort of uh, key observation in the Hostad switching lemma. So uh, right. So the I mean, so what this observation tells us is that. Well, so this map from rho to rho star together with this partial data is, is, is one to one. You can, you can recover rho from these guys here. And in fact, what, what this observation is showing is that even this map, rho star s q prime a, even this map is one to one. OK. And now, uh, uh, if we just wanted to prove Hastad switching lemma, well, then if assume that um, assume that f has width k, so so each of these, you know, this is a, you know, we can, we can, in that case we can bound this simply by k, and then the point is that the um, 
the possible data here, if rho is t bad, then the, the possible data here, well, the number of choices is only order k to the t. So, that, so therefore, the map from rho to rho star, in that case, is order k to the t to 1. And that's, that right there is the QED for hostile switching lemma. OK, so we're going to, uh, right. OK, so, but, but in, our, in our setting, we can't bound the number of possible you know, values here. So we're going to do something a little bit different. Okay. So uh, good. So, so here's, the, here's the key claim that we need to prove. Um, right, so the expected number of pre-images under this map is order log m to the t. Okay. So um, it, it'll just be nice. So let me, let me let, I'll let sigma be, you know, the bold sigma is a p-random restriction. So we're looking at this expectation here. And because this map was one to one, I mean, um, this is, we can take a sum over all of the possible encoding data for branches of length t of the probability that there exists some t bad restriction rho where rho star equals sigma uh, with, this, with this data. Okay. And as we saw, as we saw uh, before, that whenever this holds, um, then this holds, okay? So whenever, whenever, you know, rho star equals sigma with this data, that means we can recover, yeah, sorry, we can recover rho in, in, in this way. So, you know, so we have a sum over all of the encoding data for branches of length t of the following event, right, that, that you know, looks like the, you know, what happens when we try to decode. So uh, we're going to now simplify this a little bit. So we have, like, you know, that we're summing over four, four types of data here. So let's, let's pull out um, the, you know, so the, these S's form a partition of T. And these, this A altogether is a sequence of, of length T like this. So let's, let's just uh, split apart this, this uh, summation here. This prime prime is just, you know, copying this information here. All right, and let's replace this summation with just a max. And the point is that the number of partitions, integer partitions of t, uh, you know, is at most 2 to the t minus 1, and they're 2 to the t a. So, okay, we pick up a factor of 4 to the t, and we don't care about that since we, it just goes into the big O here. So let's ignore that and just focus on this part. Okay, so we've fixed, some part, we've fixed an arbitrary partition of t, and we've fixed an arbitrary answer sequence. And now we're trying to, uh, you know, it, it suffices now to bound the summation over you know, L's and Q's of this event here. Show that this is at most order log m to the t, and we're done. So we now observe that um, you know, for any given choice of the L's, L1 to LR, the number of possible choices for the queries okay, is, um, is bounded by this. So you know, we have, we have, we're taking an S1 size subset of the, the variables of the L1 and, and so on. OK, so uh, this is certainly bounded by the number of T element subsets of the union of VL1 to VLR. And then just by standard bound for binomial coefficients, this is at most E times the size of this set over T raised to the power T. OK, so if we, for any given Ls, the number of choices for Qs is, looks like this. So let's just plug that into the thing we're trying to bound. Um, so we have a sum over L, and now we have the max over Q of the, of the number of possible Q of, of this. And now we're going to do, you know, now's a sort of subtle step in the proof. I mean, I want to switch, I want to uh, switch the Q and the L here. Usually, you know, you, you, you know one can do something like this, but uh, it's, Okay, to make this uh, to rigorous, now we'll let our Q um, range over functions. Okay, so, uh, so you know, QI now will assign for every possible choice of indices L1 to LI, it will take some sub, uh, subset there. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense because the Qs depend on the Ls. Okay, so you just make them functions and you can switch these like this. Okay, now this is nice because now this lets us now fix a choice of those functions, an arbitrary choice of those functions. 
Okay, so now we have to bound, finally we're down to bounding something which is just a sum over the L's, over the uh, sequences of re relevant clause indices. Okay, and we have uh, the sum looks like this. And now we can observe the following, that so these events here, in these, these are mutually exclusive over the possible choices of the clause indices. This is sort of a key observation. And you can sort of see this as, uh, the, the best way to see this is by thinking of this sort of algorithmically, that, um, for, you know, so for any sigma, I claim there's a unique sequence of L's which makes this, or at most one sequence of L's which makes this true, right? You simple, well, clearly that you just, you know, L1 is just the first one where this, uh, this is satisfied. And now we, we take Q1 of that L1 and, and then there's a unique L2 and so on. What you did earlier, where you said that you, the L's can be like decoded. Yeah, yes, exactly. So we're using we're using exactly that that observation. Yeah. Okay. So the sum of these. So the point is that the sum of these probabilities over the L's. Is, if we drop this 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 factor here, then the sum is at most one. So now I'm going to do something that looks a little weird. I'm just going to rewrite this. Okay. This e times the size of this set to the t. I'll just rewrite this as follows. I mean, I'm going to pull this e to the t out front. And I'm gonna I'm gonna write the size of this set as you know log of two to the size of the set. Why do I do this? Because the point is that this here, so x maps to natural log of x over t to the t. This is a concave function. So it's sort of a lie. You should have a plus one here, but I'll, I'll ignore that. Okay. So we essentially have some expectation of a, of a concave function. And, and here's where Jensen's inequality comes in. So we can, we can pull this probability uh, inside here. So, so we get that this is bounded by this here. Okay, so we have some factor, you know, constant to the t, then one over t log of, now we have this expectation to the t. So now we're looking at, uh, whoops, we're looking at sort of the expected value of this thing here. And now the next, uh, the next observation is that, so this probability, that is this probability here, I claim that this is at most two to the, you know, one half to the size of this set. So I claim that these are going to cancel to, to one. <coughs> Let me just show that on one slide here. So this, I'm just going to show this over here. So here's what this probability is. Now I'm just going to forget about the forget about all these events, setting that these things to zero. We'll just look at the ones here. Whoops. So we have this clause is set to one. This clause under this modification set to one, and so on. And if you just sort of squint at it, you see that this is precisely saying that the following big clause. Okay. So it's just take the conjunction of the of clause CL1 and then CL2 where we modify Q1 by A1 and so on. But this big clause is satisfied by sigma. That's what the conjunction of these is saying. But now this, this here is a, is a clause, uh, the set of variables here is the union of the set of variables of the, of the CLs. And so the probability that, so if this is satisfiable, then, the probab then this probability equals two to the, you know, one half to the size of the set. If it's unsatisfiable, it's zero, but in either case we get this bound. Good. So, uh, one more slide back. Go back. Yeah. So this p double p codes that you have is this? I mean, is it uh, or this big expression? Should we just think of it as uh, there's some random process which is choosing l1 to l? Uh, you can think of it that way. And we're now saying, okay, if I have. So, which is why you get this get to apply Jensen's. Exactly, and it's sort of like right, and and if you will, it's sort of like the first, uh, right. So we actually get a kind of function from sigma to some sequence of L's, and this plays the role of like the first witness function. Mm -hmm. okay, well, right. okay. Now we're pretty much done. I mean, just a small calculation here. So okay, so we, we were left we, to bound this. Now we showed that this that these things multiply to one. Okay, so I just put that one in there. Now we simply recall, I mean, the, how many possibilities are there for the L's? Well, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's oh, I guess that should be M choose R, right? So this is precisely M choose R. But the number of relevant clauses is at most the number of variables. So M choose R is at most M to the T. 
Okay, and now finally this T pulls out and cancels this one here, and then uh, you know, what we're left with, you know, this is exactly E times log M to the T. Okay, so it's a short calculation. And right now, and, you know, we, we, we incurred earlier, we incurred a factor of four to the T, so altogether, we get that the expected number of pre-images under this map is bounded by 4e log m to the t. Okay. And then as we saw you know, at the beginning, this implies uh, the, the desired bound. Okay. So, right, I mean, I, I, if, you ha if you haven't seen proof of uh, you know, the pasta switching lemma before, um, I imagine many of you might have gotten lost, but ho hopefully if you look back on the slides, it should be uh, easy to follow. So the entire, the, the, throughout, so can you just go back a few slides and tell us where was the first time you used the fact that, uh, you know, where is this parameter t coming in? Uh, t? Yeah, so um, much further, much further. Yeah, I mean, it comes in a number of places, right? So that... I mean, uh, what are you using? Uh, so you're using the fact that rho is in bad t, right? So can you tell us where are you using the fact that rho is in bad t? Um, because if rho is in bad t, so this, this, I mean, this summation here is only over encoding data for, for branches of length t. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's, that's where it's coming in. Okay. All right. So you need to know that there is at least one branch of length t. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, so this is the first uh, time that uh, people analyze this expectation in, uh, in all the previous uh, proofs. Yeah, it's, just a it's just a maximum. So we're replacing a maximum with an expectation, right? And uh, uh, let me acknowledge, uh, um, uh, so actually this, this version of, of, of the result, so speaking in terms of the expected number of pre-images under this map, this, this was pointed out to me by, by Srikanth and some of his, his students. I, I mean, I, I wrote up exact, essentially the same proof, but without, this is a nicer way of saying what, what I was saying, yeah. Okay, so, um, right, so the reason I wanted to show this to you is because it actually leads to something, something neat. It, it leads to sort of a, um, un, a, a switching limb which unifies uh, some, Work that's been done recently. Um, so let me let me uh, let me tell you now about some some more recent developments in circuit complexity using uh, what I'll call multi-switching lemmas. Um, okay, so uh, so a few years ago, uh, Hastad, you know, answered one of the uh, out, you know open questions in in, in AC zero to give giving optimal correlation bounds for AC zero circuits with parity. So if you just apply the switching lemma, you get something, something which is much weaker here. So, so, the, so the optimal correlation bounds look, look like this. Okay, the precise statement doesn't, doesn't matter exactly. So what I want to mention is that the proof of this is uh, via an, a different kind of switching lemma, which is looking at multiple DNFs at once. I'll, I'll call this a multi-switching lemma. Um, and uh, another development uh, was getting a sort of optimal uh, algorithm for counting the number of satisfying assignments to AC0 circuits. Um, so this is a paper of Pagliazzo, Matthews, and Paturi, um, where they give an algorithm uh, running in time 2 to the 1 minus epsilon n for, for, for the same epsilon. And this is via a similar uh, multi-switching lemma, which is uh, sort of independently discovered. Um, the final result I wanted to mention, uh, a very nice paper of, uh, of Avishai, uh, is using, using actually Hostad's multi-switching lemma to prove the, you know, really tight bounds on the Fourier spectrum and the Fourier sparsity of AC0 circuits. Um, and right, so we have, we have so these sort of recent re related developments. And what I want to point out is that um, so all of these results actually follow from a bound on a parameter of, uh, of Boolean functions, which I'll call criticality. So this is, uh, right, so, okay. So I'm gonna give a definition here, which is very, very natural. I don't know if it's, I mean, it's something which deserves a name and I'm not sure that it's been given a name before. So um, we'll say that a Boolean function f is lambda critical for some, from some, you know, real lambda, at least one. 
um, if it has this switching lemma type uh, bound. That's the probability that the decision tree depth of f under a p random restriction is at least, b being at least t, is at most p lambda to the t for all p and t. Okay. So just give this the name lambda criticality. Okay, so criticality is the, is the minimum lambda such that f is, uh, should be lambda critical. Okay, so, I mean, so for example, it's easy to show every n variable function is n critical. Um, one can also show every depth k decision tree is k critical. The Hostad switching lemma shows every k DNF is 5k critical. And we just showed that every m, you know, size m DNF is order log m critical. So now here's the observation. Why is this, why is this concept uh, nice? Well, the observation is that if you have a Boolean function on n variables, which is lambda critical, then you have a bound on the decision tree size of the function. So not the decision tree depth, but the decision tree size. So I claim you get the, the following bound, you know, order of 2 to the n minus n over 2 lambda. Okay. And the reason that, why is this nice? Because, well, if you have upper bounds on criticality, then intuitively this is giving you randomized, you know, randomized constructions of, uh, of decision trees of, of, of this size. And if you have a decision tree for, for a function, you, you can easily count the number of satisfying assignments. So, so the observation is that from bounds on criticality, you get uh, sharp set algorithms in a very natural way. So why is it randomized? I mean, the theorem is proposition. Uh, it's randomized. Well, you'll see why in a second, but just I'll explain the proof of this. You have to actually find the decision tree. Okay, I see. Okay. Right, right, yes. That's just right. Okay, okay. Uh, so just in a few words, how, how can you see that this is, why should you believe this is true? Well, okay, you, you know, query all variables from a random set. So we, here's a dis random decision tree, which will have this size. Query all variables from a random set of size 1 minus pn, where p is, okay, just a, 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 a little bit smaller than 1 over 2 lambda. And now the observation is, you know, if you, you take a uniform random branch in this partial decision tree, then it is just a p-random restriction. And now the, the, you know, the assumption that f is lambda critical implies that the expected decision tree size of this restricted function is a constant. So by having an uh, exponential tail bound on the decision tree depth, you get an uh, uh, expected decision tree sizes at most constant. So now you just, uh, you know, if you just look at all the decision trees you get at the bottom, then you know, an expectation the size is just, uh, is just a constant larger than 2 to the 1 minus pn. And, okay, so, so this proposition's, you know, you can show it. So it's not uh, depth because there is a positive probability of something being pretty deep at the end? Yeah, yeah right. Uh -huh. Okay. So there's a very related notion to, to what I call criticality, which shows up in, in Avishai's work. Um, I get, I, I, you call it what, a switching lemma-like property or something, but let me call it degree criticality. So if we modify the definition of criticality by speaking about degree instead of, uh, instead of decision tree depth, then you know, we can call this degree criticality. And we can observe that uh, if a function is lambda critical, then it's also lambda degree critical, simply because the degree of a Boolean function is upper bounded by the decision tree depth. And now, um, what, what Avishai showed is that, um, so there are two results in this paper. Uh, so one is uh, um, using the switching lemma together with multi-switching lemma. He shows that AC0 circuits of uh, depth d plus 1 and size s have degree criticality order log s to the d. And he also shows that, uh, okay, if you have any lambda degree critical function, then you get these nice uh, uh, LMN type bounds on the Fourier spectrum, as well as bounds on, on the Fourier sparsity. And I'm not gonna, I won't say, uh, right, there's no time to say anything about what these mean. Uh, they, they, I think this, this one here at least shows up in the very nice result on, uh, on BQP. The first one is actually equivalent. Right. Yes, and, and yeah, and moreover, this, this first one is, is equivalent to degree criticality. That's another result. Right. Okay, so can we strengthen Avishai's result by proving the same bound on criticality? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can actually show that uh, using both switching lemma and multi-switching lemma, you can show the similar bound for criticality. 
Okay. And you know, from this, as we noted, that, you know, th this implies bounds on the on the uh, decision tree uh, size and SAT algorithms and so on. So this is really sort of a uh, a single result, which is telling us almost you know ma many things that we know about AC zero. What's the multi-switching number? Um, I'm not going to say what it is. I'll just say something about it. The the, the relevant point about it right here. Okay. So the uh, the proof of this has two parts. So we need to show a certain tail bound holds for all t. And to show it for, for small t, when t is less than log s, then you show it via the switching lemma in the usual way, in the way I showed earlier in the talk. And you know, we get some kind of error term that, that's from this accumulation of failure probabilities that the fa switching fails at some point. And that looks like you know, 1 over poly s. Okay? And, and the point is that you know, this, this dominates this for small t, so you get the desired bound. Now, the multi-switching lemma does something a little bit different. Uh, and it picks up a factor of s multiplicatively here. Um, and so this one is, it turns out to be good precisely when t is bigger than log s. And so the, these two cover all, all possible t and give you the result on criticality. Okay, and actually, this is what you really need to have the sat, sharp sat algorithms. Uh, okay, so he, uh, here's an open question that I wanted to, uh, to mention, and, and hopefully we can, you know, I'd love to see this solve this, this, uh, this term. Um, can one strengthen all these results by proving an even sharper bound on the criticality of AC0 formulas, right? So we'll call uh, tree-like circuits. So the natural conjecture is that uh, the criticality of AC0 formulas looks like uh, order log s over d to the d. Okay. And th this would imply the order log s to the d bound for, for circuits. Uh, now, this stopping time technique, which I mentioned in the first part of the talk, similar, uh, similar to the you know, hostile switching lemma, it's giving you the desired bound when t is less than log s. But unfortunately, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't give you the, what you need when t is bigger than log s. And I don't know how to show this. Okay. Maybe by some combination of stopping time with, with other stuff. I'm not sure. But this is, this is nice. And if one could show this, you know, you'd have, a, again, a result which is not only unifying the previous results that I mentioned, but also the, the formula lower bounds for parity. Okay. But I was able to show something. Uh, yeah. Unifying, so you're saying this bound for formulas would imply the previous one for circuits? Yeah, so let's see. What I, I said that, uh, right, so this bound here, really, you, you, can, you can derive from it these three results. You, you, you can't derive from it the, the lower bounds on the formula size or average sensitivity of AC0 formulas. So, right. but if you could prove this, then you'd be getting you know, everything. Okay. So I was able to do show something using actually this new uh, switching lemma argument, which I showed. Okay, so it's uh, so halfway between circuits and, and formulas. Okay, so I was able to get the desired bound for the class of regular AC0 formulas. So if you have the same fan in within each layer, okay, then we get this bound here. Okay, it's uh, right. Um, and, and more interesting than the result itself, I think, is the proof technique, which is taking this, uh, this sort of entropy style proof of switching lemma and finding an interesting application of it. So, right, so as I said, the proof's based on this analysis of switching lemma with log size in place of width. And the, the, the big advantage here, this, this allows a different style of induction, and in particular, you don't have this accumulation of failure uh, probability, you know, failure events, because, you, yeah, because there's no width involved. And another interesting feature of the proof is it, 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 it introduces and analyzes a canonical decision tree associated with an entire you know, depth D formula instead of just depth two formula. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a sort of horrible mess to, to say exactly what this is, but uh, right. So right. So the open question is to remove this uh, regular. So regular means it's the same um, fan art at each depth. Or fan in at each depth. Uh, yeah. Or also across the depths. Not across, just in each. Yeah. Okay. And and okay. So okay. So we get for regular AC zero formulas, we get the stronger stronger SAT algorithm and so on. Uh, I wanted to mention that. Uh, 
Yeah, just to mention, so our, this improvement to the, to the IMP SAT algorithm for regular formulas actually leads to something new. So we get improved sharp SAT algorithm for the quantified Boolean formula satisfiability problem. Okay, okay I stated here, but I want to, uh, let me just uh, gloss over it in the interest of time because I want to get to some more, more interesting stuff. Um, right, so this open problem. Uh, another interesting question I'd like to propose is, is well, here, here's another, maybe, let's call it a conjecture. Suppose I have m Boolean functions which are lambda critical. Is the and of those functions um, necessarily order lambda times log m critical? Okay. And if so, then this would imply the result on regular EC0 formulas. And moreover, it would do it in an interesting, you know, in a sort of from a semantic induction hypothesis as opposed to syntactic one. And I think it would be very, it'd be very neat if, if, if one could show this. And another question, so we s notice that lambda criticality implies lambda degree criticality. You know, is, is, is the converse true? Um, so does lambda degree critical imply order lambda critical? Okay, so there's maybe seven minutes left. And I just wanted to give you a sort of impressionistic uh, tour of some other switching lemmas out there. I mean, we've been talking an awful lot about the p-random restriction, which in some sense isn't a very interesting random restriction. Um, so yeah, let me mention briefly some other things. OK, well, the, okay, so let's see. So you can, you can take exactly m stars. That's not very interesting. You can bias, you know, you can bias the ones and the zeros. OK, and you get something. Um, maybe more interesting switching lemma uh, due to beam uh, is a sort of click switching lemma. So you have n choose two variables representing the potential edges in an n vertex graph. And we're going to f the stars are going to form the edges of a, of a click on a p random set of vertices, and the non stars are set to one with some probability q. And OK, you can prove some switching lemma for these kind of restrictions using similar kind of uh, Razbrov style arguments. You get some bound of this form. And the point is you can use this to prove lower bounds for the k-click function, um, even average case k-click function. Um, the bounds you get are of this form. You have this sort of size def depth trade-off. And you know, using a switching lemma in the standard way, you get this dependence on d. So this is something I was able to remove for constant depths, but it takes, uh, uh, it's not about proving new switching lemmas there, but rather, you, fi you know, finding new ways to use the switching lemma. Okay, so there's this very nice survey article of, of, of Beam, a switching lemma primer, which gives, you know, an account of all these different interesting restrictions. So, but what I wanted to get to in, in, in the end, just to show you some nice pictures mainly, uh, is to discuss a recent uh, breakthrough of uh, Johann Hustad. Uh, and for AC0 Frege, so these uh, restrictions for Zeiten grids. So, um, so here we're talking about proof complexity. So AC0 Frege, all you need to know is it's a proof system where the, the lines of the proof are depth D AC0 formulas. It's some generalization of uh, resolution, which you could view as sort of depth one Frege. And the point is that so the lower bounds that were known here are, are, are you know, were until recently much weaker than what we knew for AC0 circuits. So the sort of strongest bounds from the 90s were of the form exponential in n to the 1 over exponential in d. So instead of 1 over d, we had this exponential decay here. Right. So much worse than what we knew for AC0 circuits. Um, so in a, in a paper a few years ago with uh, these guys, uh, so we proved some other incomparable mild lower bound, but which introduced a new approach for this Titan uh, contradictions on expander graphs using random projections. Uh, and then whereas we got very mild uh, quantitative lower bounds, so Johan uh, found you know, the right way to do this and got you know, bounds which are almost as strong as we know in the AC0 setting for the Titan um, contradiction on grids. Let me tell you uh, about uh, this, this uh, new switching lemma that he, he introduces here. OK, so we're considering uh, an n by n toroidal grid, so just a four regular uh, toroidal grid. And let's, let's fix n to be odd, an odd number. And this Titan contradiction for this, for the, for the, for this graph is going to be an unsatisfiable 
4 DNF formula, where we have a variable xe for each edge e in the, in the graph. And we have clauses which are saying that the parity, so for every four edges which meet at a common vertex, their parity is odd. Okay? And it's not hard to show that the, because we have an odd number of, of vertices overall, uh, that this is an unsatisfiable DNF formula. So we're interested in what's the complexity of refuting this in uh, depth D Frege. Okay, so, um, right, so here we have the, the graph. And here's a natural approach to try for a random, uh, a random restriction. Um, so we want to reduce an n by n grid to an l by l grid. And here, here's the first thing you would try. You pick l uh, rows and col columns uniformly at random. Okay, l where l is odd. And now um, we're going to, for all of the uh, blue edges, so the, e so the red edges here are going to be, are going to somehow correspond to the edges in the L by L grid. For all the other edges in our graph, we're going to set them uniformly at random to 0 or 1 in a, in a way that doesn't violate any of these uh, parity constraints. Okay? So we're just picking a point in some affine uh, set. And then, um, so along these what I'll call super edges, these red super edges here, we're going to introduce a new variable. Um, and then you'll note that the incoming um, constraints you know, on either side here are sort of, in order for this variable to be satisfied, if this one is y, then this has to be negation of y and so on. So we get a projection of these four variables onto either y or not y. Okay, so this is a very natural way of defining a projection from an uh, m by n grid to an l by l grid. And, you know, so can one prove a switching lemma for this kind of uh, random projection? Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, one doesn't get a useful switching lemma this way. Just to say very briefly why, uh, you know, so to have a useful switching lemma, you know, we need this kind of tail bounds that for any, if I take any k variables in the, in the grid, x variables, then the probability that they project to distinct y variables should decay like epsilon to the k for some, for some epsilon. And the, the problem is that this won't hold because if we consider four variables which lie all on a row, then, okay, well, there's some probability that they're all killed, but you note that if one of them survives, so, you know, if one of them survives, then it's, it's likely that they all survive, and if they're sort of evenly spaced, it's very likely that they all map to distinct variables. Okay, so we don't get an exponential bound here. That's sort of what you, intuitively what you need. Right, so if, if this survives, then. so. Right, so Hastad gets around this by, by, in a very neat way, okay? So he takes a, a different random uh, embedding, okay? What it ends up looking like is something like this. You pick, your, you pick your, the points of your L by L grid, but they're not gonna be all, you know, they're not gonna be nicely lined up. And then there's a certain way that you attach them by, by sort of paths, you know, which make four turns in them. Um, and you know, the point is this is giving a topological embedding of an L by L grid and an N by N grid. And you know you, you can project to you, know, you get a projection of Sighton instances in the natural way. And you know this these random uh, random projections satisfy the key criterion that we that we uh, desired. So here the epsilon will be something like root you know, uh, l over n. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, so intuitively, why is this holding? You know, if if you have two if you have two guys which are far apart, then this probability that they both survive is sort of independent. And if they're close together, then the probability that they survive is correlated, but then again, they're likely to project to the same variable. Okay, so the, um, yeah, unfortunately, this kind of restriction is very hard to analyze with this weight, uh, weight you know, with this uh, directly. So Hastad's proof has two steps. So first he defines uh, a switching lemma which, with respect to a preliminary partial restriction, which has more independence. Um, and then, you know, this is the switching lemma which reduces the depth of each formula in the AC0 Frege proof. And then there's a cleanup step which arbitrarily completes the partial restriction to a restriction of the form that I showed. Okay? And, and you know, you need this for the purposes of induction. Um, so just here's a picture. I mean, the partial restriction looks something like this. You have many more centers than you actually uh, need. Uh, and then, right, so, and then and you sort of have crossing paths here, which introduces some complications, but, uh, and then you have a cleanup step. You know, some subset of these centers will be the chosen centers, and this will form the topological embedding. Okay. Uh, so, so to conclude, I just wanted to mention uh, another 
uh, open problem in this area. So to come up with a, a depth hierarchy theorem for AC0 Frege, this is, this is you know, uh, a very natural problem which, which is open. So in other words, find a family of unsatisfiable DNF formulas with you know, po polynomial size depth d plus one refutations, but which require exponential size depth d refutations. And just to mention, so in the, in the circuit setting, we, we have such depth hierarchy theorems. Um, they involve these read one Sipser functions. It's a very obvious choice of function that you use. But in the proof complexity setting, it's unclear what even the right unsatisfiable DNFs should be. So that's another question I wanted to. to, uh, to yes. Thanks. Squared or, do we have a separate? No, that would be fine. So, what, what, so any two depths that are not to be separated? Yeah, no, no yes, the nothing, nothing, is, nothing is known. I mean, you could get a, like with hostage result, you could get like a quasi polynomial separation, but not, not an exponential one. Um, there's a result of Kryacek, which, so it's key here that the family of formula, so they don't have, it would be still interesting if, if they weren't DNFs, but some constant depth. But if your formulas are allowed to have depth d or something like, or d minus one, then there are examples of Jan Krajacek. I mean, in some sense, the the Sipser functions are comparing. You know, they're they're not expressible as DNF. Exactly. Constraint there. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you don't have that there, so right. That's why it's hard to think what exactly are the right. Uh, yeah. If you compare a solution to a zero Frege. Uh. Yeah. They're, they're probably, yeah. Yeah, well then... Um, right, yeah. That, uh, okay, so um, what's a good example? Um, we, um, okay, we guess weak pigeon hole principle, for example, has quasi polynomial size, constant depth. Yeah. yeah. All right. More questions? Let's thank Ben again. <laughs> <laughs>